Hallelujah. We praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you praise the Lord, somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Is there somebody in this parking lot that can praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Glory to God. We thank God. We give God the glory and the honor in the name of Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give God the glory and the praise and the honor in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. We magnify the Lord Jesus. We want to thank God for the opportunity to be here. We want to thank God for the opportunity to minister, minister before you. Hallelujah. Let me get myself ready here. In the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In the wonderful name of Jesus. We magnify the Lord. We give God all of the glory and all of the wonderful praise. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, hallelujah. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we magnify the Lord. We give God the praise, hallelujah, because he is due the praise. Somebody say he's due the praise, hallelujah. Glory to God. We praise the Lord. We want to thank those out of you out there watching us on YouTube, glory to God, and on praise the Lord Facebook. Glory to God, we give God all of the glory and all of the praise, and we thank God for you. And we ask the Lord to bless you this year, glory to God, and we ask the Lord to do some a work in your heart. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, hallelujah, this is your year to come to him, hallelujah. This is your year to have a relationship with God and to know God, hallelujah, not as just religion, but to know him, hallelujah and the power of his resurrection. Somebody say the power of his resurrection. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We magnify his wonderful name. We give God all of the glory and all of the praise and the honor. I still, I want to let you know, glory to God, we have in our website and YouTube, glory to God, we have a Revelation Bible study, glory to God, that is out there uh, free. Glory to God, all you got to do is go to YouTube and type R-O-M-A-N-G-E-L-1 and the number 1, and uh, you can access that in YouTube, glory to God, uh, 23 volumes, hallelujah, 23 lessons, uh, and a total of 27 hours of preaching and teaching on the book of Revelation, glory to God, I'm sure it's going to be a blessing to you and you're going to learn something from it, hallelujah, glory to God. And there are some other Bible studies uh, that we are going to bring, hallelujah, some Bible studies on apologetics and different things that I'm working on right now as we speak, putting together very shortly, I will start bringing them out, hallelujah, for your edification, glory to God. Praise God. And we thank God and we ask God, glory to God, if you are not going to church right now, if you, if you are not going to church, you're not... Uh, Glory to have a place where you are fed the word of God. Hallelujah. Uh, glory to God, you need a place where you can be fed the word of God. And you need people that can teach you the instructed word of God. Hallelujah. People that can teach you, glory to God, the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God wants to do something in your life. But we have to discipline ourselves and put ourselves in a position where God can prepare us so he can use us. Glory to God. Amen. We want to thank God. Hallelujah. I want to speak to you about an important subject today. Hallelujah. Or what the Lord impressed on my heart. And I was thinking of, glory to God, an instance when I was speaking to a young soldier about his future. The young man, full of ambition, laid out his plan. And he said, when I get out of the army, I will get a good paying job, hallelujah. When I get out of the army, I'm going to go and I'm going to go to college, hallelujah. And I asked, really? That's great. And then what? And he said, oh, well, when I finish and graduate college, I'm going to get a good job. 
and I'll pay off my college and find a good wife. And I said, that sounds promising. And I said, and then what? And he said, then I will buy a big house and I'll have children. I said, that's wonderful. And then what? He said, oh, then my wife, uh, I will glory to God buy a big house and I will send my kids to college. Hallelujah. And I said, that sounds great. Wonderful. And then what? And then he said, well, once I send my kids off to college, I'll get old with my wife. And I said, wow, that's awesome. And then what? And then he said, glory to God, and then my wife will die, and then I will die. And I asked, and then what? And he stopped, and he thought for a second, and he looked at me, and he said, I don't know. I don't know. Somebody say, I don't know. Hallelujah. And it is in that thought that I wish to bring to you that which the Lord has impressed upon me. And I want to ask you today, have you given thought of what happens to you when your life ends on the earth? What would happen to you? Have you given thought what would happen to you if this was the last day on earth in your life? Glory to God. Do we disintegrate and become particles or matter particles like atheists say? Do we come back as cows or as other forms or life, uh, other animals as pantheists say? Do we become stars and constellations as mythologists say? Now don't get me wrong, it's not wrong to have a very, a, a half a uh, uh, glory to God, a plan, outlines, goals. It's very, it's very smart and intelligent and responsible of your life. In fact, having a plan, outlines, or goals of what you want to reach in life is not wrong. But to have a plan and to prepare for success in this life and not have a plan and prepare for the afterlife is foolish. Glory to God. Now how do we find the answers? Let us go, glory to God, to the Word of God. And in that sense, I want to take you to the book of Luke, chapter 16, and starting at verse 19, glory to God. And we read in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, there was a certain rich man. Somebody say rich man. Hallelujah. There was a certain rich man. Glory to God. Which was clothed in purple and fine linen. And fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked the sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. Hallelujah. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, 
Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which could now would not pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that you would come from thence. And then he, the rich man, said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one come from the dead. Hallelujah. Glory to God. May the Lord bless the readers and the doers of his word, of his holy word. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we magnify your name. We praise you. Father, as we bring forth your word, Father, we humbly ask that you not just anoint our lips to preach and teach and to bring the inspired word of God, but that you touch hearts to receive that you touch ears to hear and understand. That you touch hearts, Lord. So that people can be born again and regenerated by the Spirit of God. Father, we thank you, Lord. In the wonderful name of Jesus. And those of you that agree with me, we say, Amen. Glory to God. Beloved, when we look at our world today, we see a world that, as the Bible says in Romans 1 and 18, suppresses the truth. We suppress the truth about God. We suppress the truth about Christ. We suppress the truth about God's Word. And we live in an information society that through the years have learned to weaponize information, misinformation, and disinformation to push a secular worldview that hates and rejects God. Starting in our school system with our children who are trained and taught while they're in elementary, intermediate, and high school, and especially when they get to college, that the Bible is not real, that the Bible is full of mistakes, that heaven is not real, that God did not create the earth in six days and the universe in six days, and they are pushed an agenda and a worldview to reject and hate God. And you hear people, we live in a world and society with relative truth. And you hear people say, say things like, that's your truth not my truth. But beloved, there's only one truth that's worth anything and that's absolute and objective truth. Beloved, there is only one truth that's worth anything and that is God's truth. Somebody say God's truth. Hallelujah. It's the only truth that matters. It's the only truth that will set you free. It's the only real truth that will turn your circumstance around. Come on now. It's the only truth, hallelujah, glory to God, that you will, that matters because it is the only truth by which you will be judged by God. Not by relative truth, but by absolute and objective truth according to the word of God. And we see in this, in this thought and in this truth, this parable which we know as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Many people dismiss a story because it's a parable. But you have to understand that even though the characters and the place 
and the time may be fictitious, but the situation is real and relatable to us. The truth is that the lesson is real and relatable to us, and we must give heed to it, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. When we look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, there is one thing that stands out, and that is that in the Bible makes it absolutely clear that there is life after this life. There is life after death. When you close your eyes and death in this world, you will open them again in the afterlife. We're not just molecules, organisms, and matters. We're not descendants of apes, as evolutionists say. We're not related to broccoli, as natural atheists say. That is ridiculous, hallelujah. We are human beings created by God. Somebody say created by God. And we have a body, and we have a spirit, and we have a soul. We are created and designed by God to live after the physical death of the body. When God said in Genesis, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, he does not mean that he created human beings to resemble him physically. But he created human beings to resemble the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the angels in spirit. The Bible says that God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed in man the breath in man, the nostrils, the breath in man's nostrils, the breath of life. And the Bible says that man became a living soul. And being a living soul means that humans will live after life and live forever. The resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ proves this fact because that is why it is impossible that we have come from broccoli because broccoli does not have a spirit. It has life, but it doesn't have a spirit. And apes, just like the other animals, have a life. They have a, they have a spirit, hallelujah. They have a body, they have a spirit, but they don't have a soul. Neither apes nor broccoli became living souls. As the only living species on earth given a soul by God, Jesus and his earthly ministry makes us very aware of the fact that we need to consider our afterlife in our present decisions. Because the Bible is very clear in several points that after you die, you will meet God about your eternal future and Christ will be on the throne and he will do all the talking. And the Bible is absolutely clear that you will spend your eternity in one of two places. For those who are born again of the Spirit of God and have repented of your sins and believed the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will spend eternity in heaven. It's God's promise through the Savior and the Word of God. And for those of you who have rejected the gospel, rejected the Lord Jesus, rejected God's plan in your life, your Bible is absolutely clear that you will spend your eternity in a place called hell. Somebody say hell. We do not like to talk about people suffering in hell. Most preachers won't even preach about it. Hallelujah. But it is absolutely necessary for your salvation. To not talk about the reality of hell, beloved, would be like hiding the news that a great asteroid is coming or some other life-ending phenomenon is coming and coming to the earth. And I know about it, but I don't tell you about it. And I don't warn you and give you a heads up. And Jesus comes to bring light and instruction to that fact in this parable. Because he truly cares about you. And even though he knows how uncomfortable the subject of hell may be, Jesus loves you enough. 
to tell you the truth so you can avoid it and come to him and escape that horrible fate. The Bible says, Jesus said that God created hell, glory to God, for the devil and his angels. Not for you. So when God's divine plan is for the devils and his angels to go to hell, not you. God's divine plan for you is that you'll be saved by repenting and believing in him. Now Jesus in his earthly ministry, hallelujah, spoke more about hell than any other figure, Bible figure. In our day and age, people shy away from the topic of hell, but Jesus did not shy away from the topic of hell. Because it is important that we understand the reality of hell. Because if we don't accept and understand the reality of hell, then we will never rightly understand the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus explains in this parable that there is a rich man. He wore the best and the most expensive clothes. He ate the best foods. He had daily feasts and banquets in his house. And the Bible says that he fared sumptuously every day. To give you the modern translation, he had it going on. He was a big shot, hallelujah, a high roller, hallelujah. He had everything in excess and needed nothing. He was luxuriously self-seeking. He lavished his wealth upon himself and fed his appetites without restraint. The rich man was not only in his conduct heartless, but in his custom irreligious. For the Jewish law demanded and had hundreds of precepts of scriptures commanding the glory to God man to help the poor and to help those that are in need, hallelujah. And he habitually disobeyed and ignored them all. This man represents the worldly sinner who knows God but suppresses the truth about God. Man suppresses the knowledge of God in one of two ways. One is through irreligion or the denial of God and the other one is through religion or the replacement of God with someone or something else. But this we do it knowing the reality of the existence of God. Men choose to resist and oppose God's truth by holding fast to their sin. So as Jesus says and the Bible says, they are without excuse. That is why a lot of great activists, intellects of the last hundred years who have become Christians, have said what brought me to faith was not uh, some new argument, hallelujah, or some new evidence. What brought me to faith and the Christ was the fact that I came to the point to admit to myself that there is a God, that I always knew there was a God. Now, the Bible says that there was also a very poor man whose name was Lazarus. The name Lazarus means God is my help. Lazarus, who also appears, hallelujah, glory to God, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, may, may the Lord bless you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Lazarus, hallelujah, who appears to have some kind of physical impediment, because the Bible says that they laid him at the gate. He was full of sores. It was a dreadful condition. Because of Lazarus' physical condition, he could not work and better his financial situation. He could not get married. He could not worship at the temple. And he could not be with his family. And nobody did anything for him. Nobody cared for him. He wished to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. He wished to be fed with the slop and the leftover food that was thrown into the garbage. When I was a kid in Puerto Rico, I had an uncle who raised pigs. 
And throughout the year, he would make his round and come to all the house of the family, hallelujah, to pick up the leftover food and paint buckets. You know, the throw away bread, throw away rice, beans, uh, sauces, meats, and bones. I mean, it was the nastiest thing that I've ever seen at any time, a glory to God. And every time I saw him come, hallelujah, and pull his truck up with all those buckets, those paint buckets of slop in the back of his truck, I always wanted to vomit, hallelujah. That's what Lazarus desired to eat. And the Bible says that the dogs would come and lick his sores. These were wild, dirty, filthy, homeless, outcast dogs, so common in all of the eastern cities. Dogs who were street scavengers and regarded as unclean. When I was in Iraq, I could not believe how many stray dogs there were, sometimes in packs of hundreds, hallelujah. Stray, dirty, filthy, homeless dogs, hallelujah. In Eastern countries, as even in our day, that is a problem, hallelujah. So you see, you can see, and you can picture in your mind the rough and the wretched life that this man had. And Lazarus' situation would see death as a blessing and a release from a life of torment and wretched. Now as Jesus is bringing to light these two characters and their respective conditions because he understood the theology of the Pharisees. Many Jews at that time, especially the Pharisees, who were the first prosperity gospel preachers of the time, had the erroneous view of that wealthy people were always blessed and looked favorably upon by God. And poor people were cursed and looked always unfavorably by God. And the mention of table scraps, sores, and dogs made all this poor man appear odious in the eyes of the Pharisees. As Jesus recounts, glory to God, detail after detail of the rich man, the Pharisees are going blessed, mm, blessed, mm, blessed. And as he goes through into Lazarus' ordeal, cursed, yep, cursed, yep, cursed, hallelujah. They were inclined to see all such things as proof of divine disfavor. They would have not only viewed Lazarus as not clean, but are viewed Lazarus as despised by God. And it is no different than when prosperity gospel preachers and prosperity gospel followers of our day and age and world today that view homeless people and unfortunate people as outcasts of God. That is why many homeless folks and people who are in bad financial situations are never invited to church, hallelujah. Because since there's nothing you can give, then there's nothing they can take so you're considered not winnable or desirable to church. But I want you to know, glory to God, that in the eyes of God, you're important. And in the eyes of God, you have value. And in the eyes of God, because he, you have worth, because he sent the Savior to die for you. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now something happened here to both of these men. And it is here where Jesus begins to emphasize certain important truths that he also wants to emphasize to us. And the first point is that they both died. The rich man dies and was buried, and Lazarus dies and was dumped in a place called Gehenna. Gehenna was originally was a west valley west and south of Jerusalem where children were burnt the sacrifices to the Ammonite god Moloch. The valley became a dumping ground of sewage and refuse of the city. It was a place of crawling worms and maggots. Fires burned continually to destroy the garbage and impurities. Hence the name Gehenna came to be used 
as a symbol of punishment. It was here that more than likely Lazarus was taken when he died for his body to be burned and eaten by worms and maggots. And this brings an important point, and that is that death is imminent for all human beings. The Bible teaches in the book of Romans that because of Adam and Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, death came unto all men. Hallelujah. And the Bible says in Romans 5 and 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed on to all men, for all have sinned, and in Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, the Bible says in Hebrews 9 and 27, that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this is the judgment. Death is not a trip to the graveyard. Death is not even the termination of life. Death is a flight where that which is corruptible stays here on the earth and cannot enter the kingdom of God, of God will stay here, and that which goes to God will go and stand before God. For those in Christ, it will be a departure unto life. And for those not in Christ, it will be a departure unto death. That's why you must know what death is, beloved. Because if you don't know what death is, death will kill you. Hallelujah. If you're the type of person that says, when you die, you're done for, then death will kill you. If you're the type of person that says, when you die, glory to God, hallelujah, that, that you return to, to, to dust, death will kill you. If you agree with such that say, I came out of the dust of the earth, and when I die, I go back to the dust of the earth, then death will kill you. If you follow the atheistic worldview, that when you die, you disintegrate in the molecules, matter, then death will kill you. But beloved, if you're like Paul, and say that absent from the body is to be present from, with the Lord, then death, glory to God, cannot kill you. Death cannot touch you because you have a knowledge that is beyond earthly knowledge. You have a knowledge that is beyond the stars. You have a knowledge which is beyond this natural knowledge because it comes from the kingdom of God. And when you have that knowledge, you begin to prepare. You start to prepare because you know that there is a life that comes after this life. This life, this life is only a breath. This life is just a vapor. Life, this life, is just a moment, and then after this life is eternity. And as I said, when you really know what death is, you begin to prepare, because you know that depending on what you do in this life will dictate where you will spend eternity. And as I said, glory to God, now, as human beings, we understand the part where our physical life one day will end. But what many do not understand is there is a judgment that follows. There is an answering to God that follows after your physical life. Both of these men died, and let's see now what happened to both of them in the afterlife. Now Luke 16 and 23 tells us that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The idea was that Lazarus was given a high place of honor, 
sitting next to Abraham, who is known in the Bible as the father of faith. And he is sitting there at the heavenly banquet with the saints of God. With the saints of God. The rich man was buried in great honor, pomp, and fanfare. He was given the best funeral with much attendance. He was buried in an expensive coffin. Everybody sang and spoke at his funeral. They lauded his financial wealth and achievements in his education. It reminds me of the pharaohs of Egypt that had enormous monuments and great pyramids built when they were buried. And to build them required years and years of slave labor, all for a dead man. Now, don't get me wrong, it's okay, glory to God, to honor and remember those who have served and given their lives for others, those who have made a difference and had an impact in this world, those who've made great contributions to society and the people. I'm glad that in this country we honor doctors that have helped so many patients, even during this pandemic that never seems to end. I'm glad that in our country, we honor police officers and who served their communities and kept everyone safe. I'm glad that in this country, we honor, glory to God, servicemen and service women who sacrificed so much for this country. I'm a 21 year veteran myself. I was an infantryman. I more than understand what service to our country is. I didn't get to be a football player. I didn't get to be a basketball star. I didn't get to be a baseball star or a boxing champion. I became a soldier at the age of 17, glory to God. And being a soldier meant I had to give up those things. But these rich men described here in this parable were nothing of the like. They served nobody but themselves. They gave to nobody but themselves. They followed and they pursued no purpose that was not about themselves. They lived the complete lives of narcissism and only cared about me, myself, and I. And there are many in this world in our country of the life. And the Bible says that the rich man in hell opened his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, he realized that he was in torment. He could feel, he could taste, he could speak, he could hear, he could think, he could remember, he had all of the body functions in the afterlife. He could think, he could remember, he could feel thirst, he could feel hunger. And the Bible says that he sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this place. The same guy that never cared about Lazarus in his life, I mean, he had more than enough to clean Lazarus up, get Lazarus medical attention, at least clean him up and offer him employment for a wage, but he didn't. He was too busy in his life of riches to think about Lazarus. As he stayed in the gate, day by day, eaten by sores, licked by dogs, until he died and nobody cared. Hallelujah. And this shows something else about hell. And that is hell is punitive and not remedial. You can see this man's narcissistic attitude even in hell, hallelujah. 
He's not, hell is not like a prison sentence where society locks you away and hope that you get it together in a couple of years. No, hell is punitive, hallelujah. Like with Egypt during the times of Moses and the children of Israel, the Bible says that God sent 10 plagues, major plagues to Egypt, not with the hopes of plan or plans of extracting repentant behavior from Egypt. No, God was not saving Egypt. He was punishing them by killing them, taking away their provision, and sending them to hell. Now, when we look at the news and we see a terrorist blowing themselves up, we say, yep, that person's going to hell. And when we see, glory to God, a child molester, or a porn star, or a criminal, or a gangbanger, and the like, we say, yep, those people are going to hell. But what we don't realize and if they have not repented when they die, they will. But what we do not realize is that Jesus says in Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye will all likewise perish. Because man does not perish in hell because they committed crime. They perish because we are all born in sin and separation from God and have rejected the only way to be saved and delivered from this faith and that is by repenting and believing in the Savior that almost 2,000 years ago died on the cross and gave his life in the propitiating rescuing act for the salvation of our soul. Somebody says amen. The rich realizes, when the rich man realizes his eternal situation, that there is a great gulf, a great separation. So as the Bible says, so they which would pass from this to you cannot, neither they pass to us which that you would come from this, meaning that it kept that out which had to be out, and it kept in that which had to be in. He says here in Luke 16, 27 and 31, he said, I pray therefore, Father, that you will send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, that they also come not, that at least they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said to him, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they will repent. And he, Abraham said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, they will neither be persuaded, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And this came absolutely true, because later on, Jesus would raise a man who went by the name of Lazarus. And when he raised Lazarus from the dead, they did not believe. Instead, they took even more counsel to kill him and then to even kill Lazarus because the Bible says that many believed on him because of Lazarus. There are many people that believe that will not believe in Christ unless they see a miracle. And you better be careful because the devil can also perform miracles. The Bible says that in the great tribulation, the Antichrist will perform great miracles in heaven and in the earth. And if you're a person that's all stuck on miracles, watch yourself. You might end up taking the mark. Hallelujah. I tell you today that uh, that there are many people that will not believe in Christ unless they see a miracle. And it's a dangerous thing. I tell you today, you're playing Russian roulette with your soul. Hallelujah. Because God does not have to do anything extra to save you or convince you to be saved. All has been done. 
Hallelujah. Jesus has already provided to us everything that we need in order to repent and believe in him. He provided us his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection and ascension, confirming and guaranteeing the plan of salvation of God. He gave us his word, this book that we call the Bible. The Bible is inerrant. It is infallible. It is without discrepancy. And God expects you not to question what he has provided for your salvation, but he expects you to believe it and obey it for your sake. Not his sake, your sake. Hallelujah. Let me read to you from the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession, chapter 3 and verse 3. And this is uh, this verse is also in the Westminster Confession, in the same chapter and same verse of that confession. And it reads as follows. By the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestinated, or ordained to eternal life through Jesus Christ, to the praise of his glorious grace. Others Others being left to act in their sin to their just condemnation to the praise of his glorious justice. What is it saying? It's saying that God is just and righteous in giving grace to those who believe in Jesus. And he is also just and righteous in giving justice to those who refuse Jesus. Because nobody receives injustice with God. God wants to let you know today that even though he takes absolutely no pleasure in sending his creation to hell, he has to. Because besides the fact that he is a loving and forgiving and merciful God, he is also a righteous and a just God. And in his righteousness, and in his holiness, he cannot let those who refuse him, reject him, those who subjugate, oppress, tyrannize, use and abuse others to go unpunished forever. He will give you a time and a space and mercy and a time and a dispensation of mercy to repent. But I tell you today, there will be the day when God closes the door on that dispensation. Hallelujah. And if you have not grabbed on to the hope, to the mercy of God, may God have mercy on your soul. Hallelujah. God, hallelujah, will not allow the wicked to go unpunished forever. No, he will not, for the sake of the righteous. Hallelujah. Some people might ask, why would God send someone who lives in sin for a limited amount of time in their life, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and pay for their sins with an eternity? And the answer is simple. The answer is that God is infinite. And since our sin is against an infinite God, we must pay an infinite and an eternal price. Hallelujah. We must pay an infinite and an eternal price. But the eternal and infinite God is willing through his irresistible and effectual grace to give us infinite forgiveness and eternal life and fellowship with him through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Jesus is God. His life is of infinite value. Therefore, he was able to pay an infinite penalty by dying once for all, for us all on the cross. 
Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only begotten Son of God. And as the book of Acts say in chapter 4, there is no other name by which we must be saved because all of these other names that you hear, Buddha, Muhammad, uh, uh, Allah, uh, my, uh, glory to God, Krishna, all these names are not infinite names. For you to receive eternal life and escape damnation, you have to be forgiven with the sacrifice of an eternal and infinite God. And Christ was that God. He's God. He's the Word that came unto us and became flesh. And He gave His life as the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. Not like other lambs who had finite lives and can only give you finite forgiveness. But He is the only eternal Lamb of God. And through His sacrifice, you have eternal forgiveness. Somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I let you know today that God loves you. Hallelujah. And He wants to do a work in your life. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can come to Him today. You can come to him today. You can come to him today. And I urge you and compel you, come before it's too late. I will be here every Sunday that I can, but I can't promise you that I will be here next Sunday. Because if the rapture comes, I'm not going to be here. Hallelujah. <laughs> and any preacher left behind ain't going to be worth talking to. Hallelujah. Grab the Bible says that behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time is at hand. While you have the conviction in your heart, while the Holy Ghost is dealing with you, come now. You might not have that later on. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. I give you the glory. I preach what you gave me. Hallelujah. I preach what you impressed on my heart. Father, I pray that your word come not back void, that it accomplishes its will, and that it accomplishes its will in the hearts of people. Father, I pray that through this word, people are born again and regenerated by the Spirit of God. I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, amen.